And just like that, we are back. Episode 131 of the podcast today. We're talking low-ish budget filmmaking with director Rupert Sanders. Let's do it. Welcome to the Wandering DP Podcast, where we focus on Leica photography, cinematography, and life offset. And now your host, Patrick O'Sullivan. And just like that, we are back at it. And I sort of jokingly said in the intro there that we're going to be be talking about low-budget-ish filmmaking. Uh, That's quite the opposite, really. Uh, Rupert Sanders has directed a number of projects. You're probably most familiar with Snow White and the Huntsman, which is, uh, I think, about $170 million. And Ghost in the Shell, which is his most recent one, which is another $110 million. So not chump change. Uh, But we've got uh, some interesting topics that we touch upon in this very first of our L.A. Experience episodes. And it really is for the people that are looking to transition from commercial work to feature film work, which is sort of the standard story now. We've talked to so many people on the podcast, and really really that is the the ultimate goal for a lot of people to get into filmmaking, is making it into that feature world. And Rupert's got a very interesting take on it, coming from high-end commercials and and really the the top of the game to switching over and pivoting over to feature films and starting with $170 million uh, for his very first one. That's no small feat. And it's interesting to hear the backstory and how he got there and the the different ways and the different means and, and how things have changed along the way and what sort of a commitment it is uh, outside of the storytelling world. So you've got family commitments. You've got, uh, you know, is it all as cracked up to be basically? Because as I say, that's the, the end goal for most people. But as you get older and as your career progresses and you start thinking about this long term, it's you are a lot of the times, especially for directors, cinematographers as well, but for directors even more so, you're committing a giant chunk of your life to the story. So you've got to be pretty... Um, secure in the idea that you want to spend time working on this project. So it's interesting to hear Rupert's take, and it's also something going forward on the podcast that we've brought up a few different times, which is, you know, which path do you go along and, and where where do the benefits fall for feature work versus commercial work? And and are you able to maintain, is, is there such thing as a... Um, 50-year-old commercial cinematographer that only does that rather than feature work? You know, do you have to dabble in both? And what are the consequences for that? If you've got a family, if, if you're not interested in committing that chunk of time to a project, uh, what are the balances? So that's coming up on the podcast, but on, on this on this episode with Rupert, uh, you know, very interesting transition story. So if you've ever thought about making feature films, this, this is probably a reality check for you uh, in terms of what it takes because we talk about the on-set workflow. How is that different than commercials? Uh, do you have uh, less people to answer to with a budget of this size? Do you have more people to answer to? What's your creative freedom? And then what's the workflow like on set? So all those things we talk about in this episode, and I'm looking forward to it. And this really is the the start of the LA adventure for all the Patreon support that we've gotten uh, when we made the move over to Los Angeles and took over the Airbnb and turned it into a little studio. This is the very first one of those episodes. So uh, I'm excited to get this one out. Now, that being said, uh, we did all in-person interviews in LA except for two, and this was one of them. Uh, I understand. Rupert lives in L.A., I I think. Hopefully I'm not giving that away. Um, And we were in L.A., but uh, I get it. You don't want to come into the room with a stranger. (laughs) And no, it wasn't for that purpose. It just uh, schedules worked out so that it just worked better to do it over uh, FaceTime. So that's what we did. But uh, this is the very start of that. So many thanks to the Patreon supporters that are out there. Speaking of which, Patreon, uh, we are back at the live streams this week. And we were looking at Benjamin X work, who's a Patreon member who sent in this spec work that he had done. And I'm not sure if he had gotten it from the show, listening to the show, I didn't actually ask, but it was sort of the blueprint of how to do a spec ad for not a whole lot of money, but get just what you need out of it and be decisive. So we went over that in the live stream. We broke down a few different episodes. I mean, a few different stills from that project. And we looked at the whole thing. So it was a lot of fun and it was happy. I was happy to get back in there and, and chit chat with everybody and look at some Uh, listener projects to see where you guys are at. That really is the benefit of those things. So super excited to get back at it again this week with another live stream. If you are a Patreon member or if you want to join uh, and take part in these live streams, it's a great opportunity to to showcase your work and and to get some feedback and and everyone from the group uh, can be come at things with a different eye. So it's, it's nice in, in that regard. And you can do that uh, over on the Patreon site, patreon.com slash wandering DP. Uh, also, uh, this is the second episode, even though we're at 131 for the big podcast, this is the second one on YouTube. And actually this blew my mind about 2% of you made the effort this week to go over to YouTube and check out the video portion. And I understand, uh, it's weird. 
it's weird seeing my face, number one, uh, but it's also weird for a podcast just to have a, a video portion. I guess it makes sense for some of the breakdown episodes so that you can easily follow along, but uh, I appreciate it. So uh, the people that did go over to YouTube and check it out, thank you very much. We're going to keep it going for, for the foreseeable future. Uh, it makes sense for the show to do that because people are, are watching there. But uh, for these interview episodes, I don't know how beneficial this is going to be, but uh, this is the place that we are at now. So thank you to the 2% that, that made the effort. Uh, we talked about Patreon the live stream. We're back at it this week. Uh, make sure to get your projects in if you are a Patreon supporter. And uh, the live stream is going to be, I think, the day that we're going to decide on now. Essentially, it's been the last few times we've done the live streams is Thursday at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So that is the show to tune into. Now, last week on the podcast, you will recall that I uh, put forth the idea of the hotline. And on last week's show notes page, uh, you could check the uh, the show notes and you could see that there was a little audio button. You just click on that for the hotline and you could record a message. You could send in a comment or a question or a topic of discussion for the show. And uh, it worked. People sent it in. Now, the, the way that I record these shows meant we didn't have a whole lot of time to field questions. But thank you if you put questions forward onto the hotline. I appreciate it. Hopefully, we're going to get through more and more. And it's just an opportunity for people. Uh, like I say, it's almost the same as the Patreon group in that if you have a project that you uh, have shot or you want to promote, uh, hit the hotline with that information. Uh, tell us where you are, who you are, where you're from, and we'll try and get that information on the show. And it just makes it feel a little bit more real when people know who's listening. We get an idea of the, of the type of people that are listening to the show and, and commenting. And uh, and hopefully we can get you some um, a little bit of promotion for it uh, for people to check out the work. So that's the idea behind the hotline. And uh, without further ado, should we should we get into one? Let's get into the first ever hotline call. Um, here we go. Hey, this is Crew Jones from a wave pool in Arizona. Oh, first off, I guess this is the very the, the very first thing is on the hotline, you don't actually have to yell. You can just talk normally. Uh, I can play with the audio levels on my side, but just speak uh, like you're speaking into your phone. But I, I appreciate that. I didn't quite catch the name. Let's try that again. Hey, this is Crew Jones from a wave pool in Arizona. Oh, right. Crew Jones. Interesting that that is your name because uh, it is the alias of uh, myself, my preference, and maybe one of the top three cinematic characters in the history of, of cinema, really, Crew Jones, from the movie Rad. If you didn't grow up in the 80s, I, I suggest that if you're interested in a master class of storytelling, uh, you check out Rad. And you also mentioned that you're from a wave pool in Arizona, which is funny because that's also uh, where Rick Kane is from, who's the star of North Shore, another 80s classic as well, probably my favorite movie of all time. So, Hello, crew. Long time listener, first time caller. Uh, yeah, I would imagine this is a first time call because this is, a, this is the first time we've ever had these calls accessible. So uh, you are not only a first time caller, you are the very first ever caller on the hotline. Appreciate the opportunity to send in a question like this. Just want to let you know, could you pick a worse hat to wear? Okay, for the for the people that are just listening to the podcast portion, I'm wearing a Los Angeles Dodgers hat, and uh, I have no affiliation with the Dodgers, uh, but I did get a few comments, uh, people sending in, asking about the hat, and uh, so I, I don't know if I could, I could probably pick a worse hat. If I had a hat with a dick on it, uh, that would probably be worse or something offensive. Uh, this is simply a hat of a sports team. Are you even a Dodger fan? Uh, no, I'm not actually. And if you, people actually care for the hat, uh, I was at Cine Gear uh, on the plane flight over. I lost my normal hat and it's sunny in LA. I was in a jet like stupor. I come out of the plane. I need a hat. I buy one. And uh, so is the story of the hat. Come on, man. You can do better. Uh, I probably could, but uh, thank you for the call. And that, that is probably not the most ideal introduction to the hotline capabilities. <laughs> Hopefully in the future, we can keep those more uh, centered on cinematography. If you've got I don't know, questions about techniques or uh, if you've got, like I say, you got projects that you want to promote or you want to hear something about, uh, if you want to feature a guest or if you want to talk about somebody, uh, maybe maybe that's a better usage. Okay, let's go to the next call. Uh, this is the last one for the day. Hey, Wondering DP, uh, my name is Sarah and I'm calling from Melbourne. All right, we've got a fellow Australian, right? The home of the podcast, Sarah. Uh, many thanks for the call. Let's uh, keep going. I've been listening to your podcast for the last few weeks and I'm loving it. Uh Beautiful. I appreciate the uh, positive feedback. This one's a little bit more in line with where I thought the hotline uh, might take us in terms of conversation. Um, I just want to know if you could let me know how I can listen to the first episodes on iTunes. I can't seem to find them. 
Okay, so this is something uh, that in the past few weeks has sort of occurred. Because we're on episode 131 of the podcast now, that means that there's a little bit of complication. iTunes generally limits a podcast uh, or the feed that a podcast is on without boring you with too many technical details to 100. That means that the, the any episodes past 100, those get lost in the shuffle and are no longer available on any podcast app feeds. Uh, and we tried to increase that. Uh, you can, there are ways to do it, but we tried and it basically uh, completely made the website shit itself and it was down for a while. So uh, nothing like website problems to, uh, to cure uh, a bad day. But in order to get around that, we sort of had to take the past episodes, so episodes 1 to now it would be episode 1 to 30, and take those off of the, uh, the feed that, that feeds into podcast apps like the podcast player on iPhone or any other podcast app where you're listening to this. Uh, that's the bad news. The good news is that you can always listen on the website itself. So you can go to wanderingdp.com and then just enter episode 1 or episode 20 or episode whatever. And you can see the original show notes page and you can also listen to the show there. That's kind of clunky because you can't really pick up where you were listening before if you stop. Uh, if you want to listen to it actually in the podcast app like uh, podcasts on the iPhone or uh, Stitcher or something like that, uh, over on Patreon, that is where the archive is going to live. If you sign up to be a Patreon member, uh, you'll get all of the archive there and you can listen to it through a private RSS feed. You can listen to it too, straight on your phone or whatever podcast app of choice that you would like. So that's one way that we're going to try and get around it if you, uh, if you want to make it a little bit easier to listen to those archival episodes. But that's where you can find it. Uh, so thank you, Sarah, for that. I look forward to hearing back from you. Thanks. Okay, uh, that's it. That's it for the hotline. Uh, so we had... Uh, some questions. But like I say, uh, probably better. That last one was a little bit better. Keep it centered on cinematography stuff. And, uh, and yeah, we're going to, we're going to keep going because I think it will, I think this thing will start to, uh, to, to show itself as a value. The other thing that uh, we did over on the Patreon live stream was we decided on who was going to be the next guest for this next week. So we've got Rupert Sanders today, which is going to be real fun. Don't worry about that. Uh, next week, we have Colin Watkinson. And for all of the uh, shitting on English people that I've done on this show, uh, we've got, uh, well, people from the UK. Uh, we've got uh, that strong contingency going over the next few episodes. So Colin Watkinson, who's the cinematographer behind Hands Maid's Tale. He's worked on shows uh, Entourage, uh, lots of interesting stuff, and really a whole different workflow than we've ever talked about on the podcast for cinematography as shows start to escalate in size and scale. Uh, the workflow changes, and it was uh, interesting to, to, to chat with Colin, again, face-to-face you know, -face in Los Angeles, uh, and uh, a uh, really talented guy. So he's going to be next week on the show. Uh, all thanks to the Patreon voting. Okay, uh, enough of the chit chat. Let's get into the featured interview with uh, director uh, Rupert Sanders. I think you'll enjoy it. But before we do that, oh, <laughs> caught myself there. Uh, it's all made possible, ladies and gentlemen, by the support of Music Bed. Uh, music Bed is making better music accessible to everyone. That's me. That's you. That's everyone, from your wedding films and small businesses to broadcast ads and feature films, like we're talking about today with Rupert. Uh, don't know if it was uh, Music Bed was in uh, Ghost in the Shell, but it could have been. It's in feature films. They've, they've got the artists. They've got the highly curated roster of over 650 artists and composers that could make that possible. Uh, they've helped with They've helped soundtrack groundbreaking projects for Jaguar, Apple, Hulu, and Nike, as well as HBO's The Leftovers, Amazon's Transparent, and Oscar-winning shorts. Uh, and now they are upping their game with a completely revamped platform with brand new features, uh, workflows, and checkout process. You want to exclude holiday songs from your search in July? Go for it. You need a folk song that has guitar but no banjos at 120 beats per minute? Not a problem. With advanced search filters like include, exclude, beats per minute, key, song build, and more, finding the perfect song has never been easier for you or for I. Uh, I've used the website. I have seen the powers of the include, exclude. And if I can do it, surely, ladies and gentlemen, you can do it. You can learn more at musicbed.com slash new, and you get 20% off your next on-site license uh, with the coupon code WANDERING20. Now, uh, instead of that little pump fake that I did there before, let's get into the episode with Rupert Sanders. All right, Rupert, thanks for uh, taking time out of the day and, uh, and joining us on the podcast today. It's a pleasure to have you on. Pleasure to be here. Nice. Um, so for people that, a lot of people will be familiar with uh, the feature work 
that we're going to get into and talk about. Um, but some people may not be aware of what you were doing before that and how you got into it and, and the level that you came into features that was so high. Uh, I'd be interested in, in just uh, in going back a little bit and telling us how you got started in the business uh, in, on the ad side of things. So can you take us through that process? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's, uh, it was quite a long time ago now, but I, was, I, I went to art school. I, I never studied film. I studied graphic design. And when I left um, art college, I came to America and I was just kind of floating about a bit, driving an old Cadillac with a friend up and down the coast. And we met someone who said, oh, you should come and work for my friend. And we're like, we don't really want to work. We're like enjoying ourselves. And anyway, it turned up that we, we ended up in the, in the uh, desert outside Palm Springs. Um, and the, the, the girl we were staying with was a production designer and, uh, she was working with a, a commercial director called Tony Kay, who at the time was at the top of his his game, and he was uh, he was in a helicopter filming a MiG jet flying twelve feet above a Formula One race car out in the desert, and there was lots of vans and people shouting and explosions and stuff. And I was like, "Damn, this is this is what I want to do." I'd never like thought about film; it never even crossed my mind. So, very naively, as like a twenty year old. Um, Art, art department PA, I started to ask Tony, you know, what if we did that? Why don't we, why don't you put the camera there and stuff? And everyone was like, don't talk to the director. But I guess naivety does like does sometimes pave the way. Um, but I got on well with Tony. And after that, he said, you know, you should be a director. And I said, OK, I'll, I'll be a director. And he gave me three people's names in London. So when I went back home, I, I sought these people out. I didn't really know. Again, I was very naive and I knocked on the door of like three of the biggest people in advertising's uh, offices and they looked at me and like, uh, you don't have a showreel, you're not a director. And I said, oh, a showreel, that's what I need. So I went and uh, I wrote this thing for Sony Walkman. It, the, the, the copy line was, don't just walk, man. Um, <laughs> and I, I got this little kid who was rapping and he was in the back of a limo and he... He was actually on the subway at first with his his short school tie, and then he hit the door for the subway, and then he was he was kind of it was the time of of, of Biggie Small's first album, and so he kind of came, became a young Biggie, and it was about you know following your dreams and don't just walk, man, you know do your thing, and so I sold it then to Sony, so that was kind of a, a, a major leap for me. I was like, God, I can make something on my own with you know five friends and and sell it. So then Tony said, wow, this is great. I'll take you on. And so for, you know, a few years I was doing, you know, ch charity commercials and smaller things and gradually, you know, building up a body of work. And then, you know, I had I had big breaks doing stuff for Guinness and um, Nike and Adidas. And then I came to America and started doing more work here. And then I did a lot of work for Air Jordan here and Halo and PlayStation and Xbox and stuff. So I got, you know, when, when I first started working here, the, the video games market was really opening up in the commercial world. And I, I really wanted to make narrative stories. And so that's kind of, that was where I found my niche, I guess. Yeah. And in the transition from the, the times that you're, you know, you're doing all these ads and, and, you know, ads at, at sort of the, the, the very highest level, um, especially here in, in the States. Uh, how did you make the transition from that uh, to filmmaking when you decided, okay, you know, I, I'd like to get into the longer form stuff? Did you lay out a plan of, I have to do a certain number of shorts and that way I can transition into something smaller and then get bigger from there? How did you, how did you decide to do it? Yeah, I mean, ironically, at this, the same time that I was driving around America, I really wanted to make a film about transients on the railroads so I wrote that, I was developing that, and I thought, oh, this will be my first film, and, and we sold it, and it kind of just never really went anywhere. And, and so I did a couple of short films. I did one called uh, D Minus, which is uh, based on my brother-in-law's experience growing up in, in Tarzana in the 80s. And then I did another one based on Black Hole, the Charles Burns novel, that I, I actually really wanted to make that film, and I knew that it was out there, so I made a short to try and get it. Sadly, neither of them kind of moved forward to the to the feature level. But, you know, I, I did them when I can. I really enjoyed doing them. And I knew that, you know, I, I really wanted to find that feature. And, and it's, you know, I was I guess it was easier for me to get a bigger studio picture at that time than it was to get a, uh, you know, a, a more independent film off the ground. Um, 
And I was lucky, you know, I got I got um, asked by Steven Spielberg to come and meet him when he saw some of my Halo work. And then a couple of other producers saw some of my work and I, I went to meet Joe Roth and we had a very good meeting and, and he said, you know, what about a fairy tale movie? And it, it wasn't like at the top of my agenda at the time, but when I went home and thought about it, I was like, you know, what? I, I, I'd like to do something in a genre that I could do something different in. And I'm, I'm obsessed with history. I'm obsessed with um, Victorian kind of obsession with fairies and fairy tales and Alice in Wonderland and those kind of things were all things that I grew up with. And, and, and I, I thought that I could do something in that, in that genre. And I also liked the idea of, of making a, having a strong female lead and, and an unexpected version of, a, of, of an older fable. So that was the first film I did. So I went from, you know, naught to, you know, a very big budget very quickly, which was, which was quite a shock. Yeah, I can imagine. And, and how did you, how did that change your, or, or how did that mold the way that you approach these things? Was it, um, was it, did you just consider it like a, a very long ad that you were approaching and, and you still had people responsible for, you know, making creative decisions in the process that you had to collaborate with? How did that change the way that you approached the work? I think in a way, um, I, coming from commercials, I was, I was pretty well equipped. You know, I, I, I'd, you know, been making commercials for 10 years. So I, I knew a lot about visual effects. I knew a lot about, you know, camera and how to move the camera, where to put the camera. So that, that side of it, the technical side of it wasn't, wasn't like a challenge. I think the challenge was, you know, going from one or two cameras to seven cameras um, having action sequences with hundreds of people versus, you know, 20. So it definitely, you know, but I'd done big kind of war scenes and for Xbox and stuff. So it was, I kind of felt at home in that world. And, and the stuff that I, I guess I hadn't really flexed my muscle in was, was dealing with actors. So I, I did a kind of, I did an acting course for a three months so that I, I understood the language of actors and how to not, I didn't want to like, you know, be able to act in order to, you know, express to them. I think it was just understanding the process and understanding their language. And that made me a lot more confident going into it. So when I was on set, you know, the first thing we started with was big action sequences. And I was like, all right, th that, that, that I can, I can handle. And then, you know, my first big dramatic scenes were with Charlize Theron. So, you know, she's a very gifted actress and very, very talented and, and very powerful. And so I felt like it, 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 unless I'd had those acting, you know, that, that time to understand the process a bit more, I, I at least felt I had something on the back of a postcard going into it rather than, again, total naivety. And she's quite formidable, Charlie. So I didn't want to be kind of cowering in a corner saying all the wrong things so i felt going in I, I had a bit more confidence yeah and, and does that confidence come from are you someone that is very um, pre-production heavy and i imagine on a movie like this and on some of the commercials you, you mentioned being very familiar with the technical side of vfx and and whatnot is that something where if you do the pre-production you feel more comfortable uh, on set on the day to to be able to improvise and find moments because you have that backbone is, is that how you yeah. like to work rather than getting there yeah. on the day yeah yeah, definitely. I mean, I think you'd be foolish to show up on on the first week of, you know, of a $170 million budget of your first film going, well, what are we doing today? You know, I think it's very important to, to have that prep work. And like you say, if you've if you've got your shot list and you've got your little sketches of what you're doing and you know what you're trying to say in each scene, then, you know, you feel confident and you do have the room uh, and the time. It buys you the time, which is really the most important thing that you can have on on set you know you don't need all the toys and all the tricks you need the time you need the time to get the performance right you need the time to build the performances and and the way the camera observes the performance uh so that the combination of the two equals what you're trying to say with the scene and the dynamic of the scene um you know n needs that work but also there's that gives you if you're prepared and you're not all scratching your heads going how do we get the camera there or why you know oh maybe we should do it like that you know if you you have to go into that day knowing exactly what you're doing and then you can say well you know what maybe i'm just going to try doing something quickly very different let's do this let's do that or it just gives you more time and therefore more freedom yeah and from the outside it, it sounds like that that sounds like a very 
plausible thing that would happen that you prepare and then you find the time on the day to do that. Did you find that to be the case um, when you get on set and you're actually there and all those people are there? Did you still, you know, did you feel the pressure of, oh shit, we've got to stick to what we've got because we've only have so much time or did you, did you loosen up and, and allow yourself to find those moments? No, I think, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting point. I think, you know, there's, you know, these, the, the things that you're doing deviating from the plan are kind of subtle. And sometimes, you know, you're, you go in with the, with the best laid plan and, and the actors block something totally different. So you're like, okay, well, that's fine. And you can't control an actor and say, no, you've got to be here. You've got to be there because of, you know, what we're doing visually. And I, I learned that the hard way, but you you have to go in and 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 say okay i understand you know and and the one thing you don't really do in commercials you don't go in in the morning and block a scene you turn up you 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 know you you, you know exactly where everything's got to be and you shoot it whereas with a film you know you put the scene on its feet you, the actors inhabit the space or the environment and then you kind of making these decisions uh, quite quickly as you're watching it as to where the camera should be and how you should shoot it. Um, and that really just comes from experience of, of being able to, um, to think quickly and go, okay, everything's changed. Um, we know that we've got to do it differently. All right, you go and get dressed. We'll meet you back here in, you know, half an hour and we'll be ready. Yeah. And in a, in a, in a process and in a project like this with the budget and the time, is it something where you, knowing that, again, you took that, that actor's course to sort of develop the language, did you have any chance to do rehearsals? Was that something that you'd be interested in? What, what was the process for, for you getting to know the actors beforehand before you set on, on set? Yeah, I mean, I think to me, you know, I always imagined rehearsals would be kind of lots of people in tracksuits with chalk marks on, on wooden floors and kind of stage hands, But actually... To me, the the biggest part of the rehearsal really is is conversation and and really um, understanding you know what what the what the actor wants to do with the character and them understanding what you want to do with the character. And so I think that that actually, if you go into the whatever the scene is, knowing what each of you are doing, then the rehearsal is is kind of more of a, a, a functional thing of, of how we're moving around this space so you're you're you know my the the funnest part to me I guess working with the actors especially you know on, on the last film I did with Scarlett we we spent a lot of time talking about the character because it was a very complex character but we knew in every scene that we'd met we we developed a shorthand about the character so we'd discuss something you know for hours before the onset would be like you know she's got to do that thing to to illustrate that or she would do that because and that comes from to me what is the rehearsal which is which is building the character you know the the rehearsals with all the cast on 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 set weeks before is kind of a luxury because most actors that that are you know that successful you know aren't flying in weeks before to do rehearsals you kind of have to take it as you can i mean we do you know you do more ironically more like action rehearsals than you do actually acting rehearsals but i guess that's the nature of the two films i've done have been more more visual and more performant uh, more um action driven i guess i'm sure you know when i do something that's that's pure intimate drama then obviously your your little rehearsal time is consumed by that and not by all the other things you need to do on a bigger film yeah and and that goes for as you say building the character but in when it comes to building the world the world of of these these movies where it is quite big and it's complex and it's uh, uh, a lot of moving bits and pieces when you sign on to do it you say okay yep uh, i'm going to i'm going to do the the film um what is the process like for creating that world is it first about finding collaborators is it about you going out and creating some sort of giant lookbook where you take that now to people and and show them the direction or how, where does the process start on something like this I think um, you know it's it's reading the script a few times. You know, as as a visual kind of thinker, whenever I read, I see, and I think you know most people do that. I think it's just trying to remember what you see when you first read it, and then it's kind of you know it used to be going to art bookstores or the libraries and trawling through thousands of books and looking at images that kind of reflected what you were thinking or inspired you. But now, to be honest, it's a lot of sitting in front of the the computer. You know, trawling through 
Tumblr and Google and you know finding uh, finding those images and then just you know I just create like dump boxes of thousands of images that kind of then I start to collage them together and start to kind of get a feeling of of what I'm trying to express visually um, and that can be you know they can be completely random or it can be very kind of cohesive and then those things start to like jog other ideas in you that like oh maybe we should do that scene you know or lit or that scene at night or let's let's design an android that's that's built out of ceramic china or you know they can be like it can be as simple as looking at a a tea set in a in a kind of catalog and going oh, i know what that android should look like you know it's not that you're specifically looking for an android to to rebuild you're looking for ideas that kind of so that i think is the biggest process and then for me i do a lot of sketching and drawing and and start to kind of think of what is the underlying idea of what i'm trying to say with this film and and what do i want people to see and think and what kind of world do i want them to to be immersed in and for me the world creation is so important to be 100% real you know even if it's fantastical it has to feel like you're dropping people into an environment that they've never experienced and they are experiencing firsthand yeah and then once you get once you go through that process yourself and you're finding out all these things, what is the process like? Because a lot of the times we'll have, um, you know, either cinematographers or directors on the show that are very uh, commercial centric and they try and move over into features and they find that it's different worlds and, and mm. people people move in those circles that maybe don't move in the ad circles. When you when you get that sign on, OK, we're going to do it. Um, what's the process, especially the first one? Um, for finding your collaborators? Is it you're still looking for people that you've worked with in the past? Are you getting recommendations from the studio or the producers? How do you go about finding the people that are going to help you along the way? Well, I've, I've never really moved in, in circles in, in, in either world. I think it's, I've, I've always like found people along the ro- along the, j- the journey that I've really enjoyed working with and I've kept those people moving forward. So there's been a, a small group of probably 10 people who as production designers, editors and directors of photography I've worked with um, for, you know, since, since, since the very beginning, you know, Jess Hall, who's a DP I've worked with often, um, we started straight out of St. Martin's together. He shot the Sony Walkman thing I did. And we've, you know, we've worked together on, on numerous commercials and, and he just shot Ghost in the Shell for me and other people like Greg Fraser and Chris Zeus. And, um, so I've, I've had a very, you know, I've, I've been lucky to have a kind of a group of, of uh cinematographers and a group of uh designers and then uh, an editor i work with pretty much every time neil smith out of out of work post you know i've i i have a great shorthand with neil and and i'm not really i'm not really looking for anyone beyond those those people um because we you know like with the actor that we've we've done years of rehearsals you know, we, we really are in step with each other and that's, you know, that's very exciting coming to a new project. Yeah. And, and in terms of uh, director of photography and, and cinematographers, are you someone that is very technically oriented with camera stuff? You know, you'll talk to some directors and they want to be in control of the lens choice and where the camera's going and, and other people will say, you know, uh, we've hired Greg Frazier or Jess Hall mm. and, and they're going to be in charge of that and all uh, it frees me up to worry about other things. Where do you find yourself in that in that scale? No, because I think, I mean, I think that a good collaborator is, is developing that, you know, together. I'm, not, I'm never going to tell Jess where to put his key light or what T-stop to be at, but we will talk through a scene and we'll go, yeah, that's a great, let's put it up, you know. I, I, I sometimes I'm very specific about lens and where the camera's going and how it's moving but again it's i rehearse with those guys and we'll sit before and go how do we want it to look you know what are we trying to say how, you know what's the texture what's the style of the cinematography through the film and we'll come to it through the same process as you do with all of the heads of departments and your actors is by conversation by discussion by illustration um, and then so when we get to that scene we're like well this should be you know, that thing we talked about because we're trying to create that look in this scene. Yeah. And in terms of the, the structure of uh, the, the differences between the, the major ad world, sort of the high-end ad world where you have, you know, you've got to think about 
um, the creatives, you've got to think about the agency and the, and the client and all those people who have um, influence in the final product versus a, a feature film. And did you find, or was there a period of adjustment of rearranging how you approach the work because of the different systems? No, I mean, I've always just done the work and, 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 you know, I, I, I understand that there's a hierarchy to both things. I think in advertising, it's got, it's got too much. It's funny when I was doing Huntsman, I remember like, you know, a couple of weeks in, I looked around me and I was, you know, almost waiting for the, sh- you know, everyone happy. Can we move on? And I was like, there's no one there. It's yeah. Like, all right. All yeah. that. That's, you know, it was kind of a little bit worrying actually having for so long been like, you know, is everyone good? And I just, I think actually that the, um, the advertising model has, has really got to change because I think it's really suppressing creativity. I think that, you know, th- there just aren't that many good commercials anymore. I think the amount of great workers over the, you know, over the last five, six years really dwindled because I think that, the, um, you know, obviously fewer commercials are getting made, um, m- less money is being spent, therefore more rides on each project project and less clients want to make commercials so the few that there are they put a staff of 50 people on set on them making sure that nothing goes wrong and and everyone's trying to cover a different aspect of it and you 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 really stamp on anything that's that's creative and you know the constantly overthinking god is the client going to want that or maybe we should do it that way anyway just in case he wants it and you just find yourself in a in a in a very you know straightforward model of filmmaking which isn't the kind of advertising that that I grew into with with you know Mavericks like like Tony K yeah and did, did you find or did you know uh, after you do the first film that that uh, this is the direction that you want to go in because I know a lot of people the end goal is is long form narrative stuff and uh, you know you you work so long and you and you say you've been in the ad game for 10 years at that point uh, yeah it, was it something like okay this is exactly what I thought it was going to be like and I want to do more of it or yeah 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 I very quickly I mean I you know I love commercials I've had an amazing career in it I've travel around the world i've worked with amazing people i've been very lucky um and i you know that was a blessing for me somehow you know i i just i fell into it and i literally did fall into it i really never thought that's what i would be doing but i you know the more i got into it the more i enjoyed it and then you know when i when i first did the film i was like you know it was great to be in in at pinewood you know shooting there and i you know you do become a child when you go into the you know, the armory and you see them making swords and shields and you go to the, you know, the prop show and tells and they've got horses dressed in, in, you know, medieval saddlery and, and, um, armor and, and you go to the, um, to the plaster house where they're making all the, the, the stone for the castle. And, you, you know, it's, it's, it's hard not to be kind of consumed in that. And, and it's so, it's very exciting. And I just, I don't know, you know, what else I could possibly want to do or be able to do at this stage. I've kind of burnt most of my bridges in, in committing to this life. Um, so, you know, I think it is a, it's a wonderful opportunity. And it's, you know, what, what I love most about it is the collaboration and working with so many different types of creative people from, from you know, writers, authors, poets, to, to singers, to choirs, to, you know, people who just specialize in making medieval leather to you know um production designers to illustrators to model makers you know to visual effects special effects it's an amazing array of of uh misfits and and creative people who who you know love what they do and and inspire you and you you your job is to inspire them yeah and and on these, uh, especially on on the on the films, it, what does the structure look like for for yourself in working? Do you have people around you b- besides the you know the heads of department? Have you got people there, uh, either producer or someone else that you're chatting to in between setups and, and making sure you're on track and and just bouncing creative ideas off of that that are you know what what's the structure behind your decision making process there? Um, I think it's more you know I I think it's probably more 
with your i think i i have a very close relationship with my director of photography um and he's probably like the person i have the most conversation of on a scene um and then you know my editor when when i go at the end of the day and um and watch scenes coming together you know he's probably the 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 kind of yardstick of um performance and guiding the performance um and the dp is who i talk most about um you know how things are looking and and how to accentuate what we're looking for in those performances but also you know a good dp's got a good they're the kind of the first eye in a way on the performance and and i think that if if you you know if you sense if 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 they give you the nod that all's well you know you you're pretty sure it's all well when their eyes glued to the viewfinder but less and less usually they're further back in a tent on just a slightly nicer screen than I'm looking at. <laughs> so I always like to be near the camera, but it used to be that the DP literally, you know, the performance was to them. You know, they had their eye on um, on some of those performances. I think I remember actually speaking, I think it was Wally Fister, who I've worked with quite a lot, said to me, you know, that I've had I've been privy to like having personal shows of some of the best actors in the world right before me. And I was, you know, I was all alone there, like listening to it live watching it just through glass you know and that's that's really true but the more that we kind of get detached via the umbilical um the further away from the performance we get yeah so i like to be very close to cameras you know and i don't really sit down i, I have a small clamshell and i sit you know as close as i can to the performance or where the camera is yeah and, and it has has it changed your 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 workflow on set or the way that you operate on set uh in the transition from film to digital as things start to uh, change as you say has, has it changed any of your uh how you perceive performance and, and things like that no i mean i think i think you know as a director you're you know you're always a little bit detached because you are you know either either watching it um as it happens from the camera's point of view and then and then reviewing it on screen but i think you know as far as workflow goes i'm i'm not um i don't notice a massive difference between film and uh digital really as far as the the kind of on set life goes i think it's a little there's a little less um kind of uh the, the camera was quite selfish in a way in the film era that that it demanded a lot of attention you know oh it needs needs more film now you know it needs feeding again it yeah. needs a new battery it's got it you know the, and digital just kind of quietly sits there and observes everything without you needing to feed it too much or it was a bit of a diva i think a film camera yeah you know, it was an actor who required lots of conversation and lots of stopping every, what we were doing and focusing on it. Yeah. Whereas digital just kind of does the job and qu quietly and, and, and efficiently. Yeah. And, and when you get through with a project like this, you've been working on it for however many months or years that it's going through. Do you immediately get done and say, OK, uh, I want to dive back into something else or is it uh, I want to just uh, I'll do commercials now and, and try and, you know, have a, have a project lifespan that is significantly shorter just to have some fun and, and make some stuff that, that, that's been building in your head during that period when you've been working on one thing. Yeah, it's funny. When you're working on one thing, you're, a, you're, you're pretty, um, pretty monogamous to it. There's not much time for having you know, wild fantasies about other things. It's like this is, it's, it's all absorbing. You know? there's, 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 really, there's really nothing else when you're on a, on a film because there's so many aspects you're having to work on. And that goes right up until the last minute and then it premieres and then you're done. And then suddenly you feel kind of a sense of grief for a while because you've, you know, you've, but also relief um, because, you know, the bigger films are, uh, you know, you're, you're handling a lot of bandwidth from the publicity to the poster design, to the press tours, to the, um, you know, finishing, cuttings, test screenings, you know, there's a lot going on, even, you know, the set bit's really the easy bit, although 90 days on set, you know, is, is grueling, um, you know, usually with a couple of units running. So you don't, you don't have time to think about anything else. And then when you're done, it, there is a relief and, and commercials is great because you can say, all right, I want to get back to work and I'll go and do something. But but it's not, you know, it's not as nourishing because it feels 
having gone into those those journeys of 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 you know big filmmaking you come back to a commercial and it, and it I still enjoy them but it just it does feel very different because it's much more surface you know you're not really there's nothing beneath that surface you can't really say that much with a commercial you know yeah and in the time that so the the huntsman comes out uh, do you did you actually go back into commercials or did you say uh, no i'm just going to explore my options and see what's next now that i've tasted the feature world no i mean the feet you know feature world again it's not you know it's not like you finish one and then oh great i'll do that one please you know they all you know they all take a lot of work you know i i was um i did commercials after huntsman i met on other projects i developed um a couple of things that that i was you know consumed in for eight months and then they they lost their momentum and so then you're back to square one but it's you know and that's very frustrating but you can't really let it affect you because films are mercurial and sometimes you just you know you're on a moving train and and you can't get off and you're just going forwards and other times you think you're going forwards and then actually you're just stuck in the middle and nothing's actually really happening um so it's you know i think people would love to just jump from one film and then when they want to do the next one they do it but the the films have their own their own desire and they tell you when they want to be made you know yeah and did you find that once you do get done with it and and it's a success and things come out that now you're getting you know do you get a flood of fairy tale um we want you to be the fairy tale guy or or... no because i think i think you know huntsman was in that period where that was kind of it being explored um and then you know ghost in the shell was a very different film and i think my next film will be a very different film too i mean it's not I don't, I think in commercials, I've never just done that thing, you know, Um, I never was the car guy or the, you know, the slow motion guy or the, I don't even know what my pigeonhole was, but I was never like inundated with a similar kind of thing, you know, And and I think films, you drive them yourself, you know, you know, people send a lot of scripts and you read a lot of stuff and that's part of the education too. And then it's just finding that thing that, that really, you know, really gels with you and you go, God, that's, that's, that's a story I really want to tell. I really want to explore that world or I'd love to work with them. You know? Yeah. And, and how different was the process in getting the job when it came to Huntsman versus Ghost in the Shell? Because you, you sort of had already had the, 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 the track record. Uh, it wasn't a first time thing. Was there any, yeah. any more or less convincing or any harder or easier to get to actually get on the project or how did it come to you really? Um, it came to me, uh, ironically, uh, through Steven Spielberg, who was who was going to direct it and then didn't. And we had met after Huntsman. Actually, he he asked me to see him about another film, but it it, it wasn't something that that we felt was right for me. And then um, he kind of kept in contact. And when when he was talking about Ghost, he came to me. I went in and met him and the producers, and and I. I had one meeting and said, this is what I, you know, this is how I see it. And, and this is what I'd like to do with it. And, um, yeah, so then, you know, they, they put me on it and then it was a, it doesn't mean once you're on a film that it's a going to get made or B going to get made with you, but you know, you, you move forward with it and you try and develop the vision, the vision for it. And then it's about, you know, selling it to the studio and selling the script and selling the budget. And so that took, you know, that took a long time. So we were developing the look of the film for quite a long time to show the studios what we were going to do. And then they decide how much they want to spend on it and who they want to star in it and, you know, those kind of conversations. So it's, I'd love for this situation to be, I'd like to do this one now and I'd like to do it for this money. It doesn't really happen that way. You know, it's a, it's a long fight to get any film made. You know, I think there's a, there's a tendency for people to think that it's just, that you can do what you want when you want and and it turns out exactly how you want it to but it's just simply not the case you know it's a it's a it's a hard fought battle of attrition for for years and you don't or you don't always win every battle or or every skirmish you know you might you might not even win the war you know taking your experiences was there any particular area where you had learned something that you then adapted to or or put forth on ghost in the shell to try and avoid that situation no, I don't think it's I don't think it's specific. I think, you know, you you see these, you know, you understand them more for what they are and when you're told no, you don't necessarily, 
you know, get upset about it. You just try and find a way to, to, to go another avenue in order to do it. You know, you're always fighting for budget. You're always fighting for time. Um, and that's for the good of the film. Um, you know, I think you, you want to, to do everything you can in your power to fight for what you believe in. Um, and that's why people hire you, you know, ironically, they want, they want you to fight them. You know, they want you to, to have your opinion. They want you to push your agenda because otherwise, you know, they don't have someone steering the ship, you know? So I think it's important that you, you stand up and fight for what you believe in. Um, even if, even if ultimately that's wrong, um, you have to be, um, you have to be there to make your film or your commercial, um, and you have to deal with those with those battles as you go in a in a in as polite a way as possible, but all, always try and figure out a way of you know having the common good of the project you know always to mind. If you have to lose something in order to get something else, then then that's what you have to do, and you have to make those decisions almost momentarily on a film. Yeah. And you'd mentioned earlier when, uh, you know, you're trying to get the film off the ground and you're trying to get the studio into the script and the story and then into the talent. What's the process like? Is it any different in, than in a commercial sense for a casting process? You know, do you go away and choose, I don't know, the, the three people that you see in the role and then uh, you turn it over to the studio ha ha or or is it the reverse? They, they tell you these are the people uh, that we Yeah, I mean, the studios, the studios you, you know, usually have a pretty, pretty... Um, pretty easy to deal with in that you know as long as you're not making crazy decisions i think you know if you've got they 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 need to make films that people go and see they need to make films with with movie stars you know and and the beauty of casting a movie star or or a, a group of movie stars is that once you've done that you can kind of cast who you want because the pressure's off you know i think it gets harder when you have to build a cast together to cover a lot of global um you know markets versus having a a big movie star who covers all those global markets and then you know i was able to cast takeshi katano um in a in a in a hollywood movie as one of the leads who only spoke japanese and that wouldn't have happened if if i hadn't had uh, scarlett johansson starring in the film so you just you know it's it's kind of a currency you just got to be clever with with how you do it. And it's great to be able to get, you know, younger actors. Like I, I've, I got Pilu Asbeck, who's a, 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 an amazing Danish actor again to, you know, into a big role. And those things wouldn't have happened without, without Scarlett. So it's, you know, it's, um, there, they want to make sure that they have a, a profile name. And if they don't, they need a certain amount of names, um, to get the film to be sold. But, you know, ultimately their goal is the same as my goal is to, is to make a film that people want to see whatever yeah. the budget. Yeah. And, and we've had directors on in the past when, uh, on the show and we come in and we ask them, you know, is there one specific area of pre-production or one specific area of production where you find yourself often, um, at odds with other people or, or that you're fighting for, or that you, you feel is so important to the project that it's worth, you know, you know, as you said before, picking your battles and, and doing it politely and knowing when to, to, to chime in. Is there one particular aspect, whether it is casting or whether it's uh, production design or uh, cinematographers? What, do, you, do you find yourself often um, in one particular area going to bat for, for projects? No, I mean, I, I've actually I've very rarely had a, a battle with, with a studio really over, over any um, heads of department. I mean, they usually want you to be surrounded by the people that you like to work with. Um, and then in, um, I think the hardest part probably is around the test screening and the kind of final cutting of the film, because that's test screenings are probably the worst thing you can ever do. It's like standing naked on stage in front of a thousand people and they all, uh, point <laughs> out things that look weird about you and, and, you know, you have to keep turning around and then bend over and they're all laughing and pointing and you literally feel so humiliated. Yeah. And then you have to sit there in the back of the audience while they all discuss the bits of you that they didn't like and <laughs> why it looked weird and wobbly and why that bit had a mole on it. And 
So it's a thoroughly, thoroughly debilitating process. And then you have to get back on usually, you know, a, a plane with all the studio heads and you're still naked and they're still all looking at you and, and saying, well, you know, we know you've got those bits. What are we going to do about them? And, and it's, uh, you know, or you're just unfixable, you know. So it's a very, uh, it's the time you probably feel most alone, I think, um, because, you know, so much is at stake and there's, you know, and there is, that's when it's, it becomes a bit of a battle because then they start to have crazy ideas like, you know, let's cut the ending off or let's get them to say this. And that's when you're, you know, again, it's like you've run two marathons and you're just crossing the finish line and it's the last kind of these hurdles pop up and you just, your body just wants to say, all right, you know, whatever, do it, you know, but you're, your those decisions at the last minute are the ones that you know they stay there forever what what you create is there for forever and if you give in then you might as well give in on day one so it's very important to keep that you know keep the the fight in you all the way to the finish line because you know you you make quick decisions at the end because a lot of people are trying to fix a problem that really can damage the film and and those those um you know those decisions are 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 indelible and someone someone um recently described it really well to me that that there's a lot of temporary people making permanent decisions and it's true there's a lot of people who won't be in that job in you know the next month or the next year and yet they're making big decisions about a film that will you know go into people's homes and be on their shelf or in their cloud or hard drive for you know lifetimes um and so it's very important to make your you know keep keep fighting till the end yeah and what what has that experience been like for you what is the what is the process like is is the edit you go away and you come back with you know uh, different sections of the movie and then you start to get feedback immediately or do you get to present like this is okay this is this is it and then the changes start from there um it's it's usually you'll you'll present a first cut but the first cut's always too quick um you know you have i think 11 weeks contractually to cut a film that you've spent you know a year and a half on um which goes pretty quickly so you know obviously your editorial department are kind of cutting as they go along so they've got scenes together but then the other most harrowing part of the process, is, I'm sure any director will tell you, is, the, is watching your first cut, because that again is the that's like looking in the mirror, again. yeah. And you're standing naked. It's a it's a very you're like oh, okay, this is this doesn't work at all. What the fuck am I going to do? It's a real, it's a real uh, yeah, come. It's, it's, it's a real kind of awakening. And then you have to, you know, you go away and you go, okay, you know, that's when the real work begins of, of trying to make what you've seen make sense. And, and then, you know, you go and you show it to the studio, you know, a week or two after that. And then they all look at themselves going, what the fuck is this? And what the <laughs> fuck have we done? And, and so gradually, you know, you, you, fi- you find the film. And actually what I, what I didn't realize, I guess, going into it was how much of the film you find, um, you know, editorially. Um, so many bits of, of um, films, you, you know, are like scenes are made up out of things that were shot from different things and, you know, a lot of over-the-shoulder dialogue when you can't see the actor's lips moving and reworking scenes like that. I mean, it's really, it's not ideal, but sometimes it's what you have to do to kind of make things work or fix scene flow or stuff. It's, um, it's been done since, since film started, I'm sure. But it's, uh, you know, so it's amazing how gradually the film starts to take another shape. So you, you kind of make the film three or four times. You know, you make it in your head when you first first read it and you're all like, happy and excited and giggly and then you know you make it when you when you shoot it and that's kind of fun but exhausting then you make it in the edit again um and you're a bit more tired and then you make it kind of for this for the audience and the studio at the end and that's probably the most grueling and exhausted part of it yeah and when you look back at those different versions if we talk about ghost in the shell 
you, you look at that when you first read the script and you got all those ideas in your head and this is how we're going to do it and this is how it's going to be. And, and then you see the, the final version, you know, that people see in the theaters. Mm. It, is there is there elements that you can see in there that, that manage to survive and, and make it all the way through or is it something that completely that completely changes? No, I think, you know, the, the big the bigger brushstrokes are there and some of the smaller, you know, Ghost is a very highly detailed film and it needs a few watchings to kind of see the layerings of it so i'm i'm proud of the work we all did putting that that stuff in there and putting it on the screen and 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 making sure that that level of of detail and design was was in every every frame but it was um you know i st- I, I look back on you know uh files of stuff that i had or drawings that i have and and it's funny you see stuff that just really wouldn't have worked in the film or stuff that that is a very different version of the film and you always you know you wonder i don't think i made a conscious decision of like you know wrote down my manifesto this is how the film should look it just kind of it just kind of you guide it and your your touchstones are you know the things that you pull along with you and there's other many other versions that you just decided not to go down because that was just what your feeling was um you know i sometimes you look back and go god maybe i should have done it that you know black and white and and you know you know whatever anamorphic and that just wasn't how we did it and and so but that's just part of i think the creative process is just you know where you are at that time and what your what what is influencing you and what you grab onto and what you discard yeah and are you do you find yourself able to look back now uh, at the films and and see them for the films that they are or do you do you still look at them and be like oh jesus we should have shot the, another take of that one <laughs> yeah not yet i mean i, I haven't <laughs> looked at either of them they're, they're, they're harrowing processes and it's funny I, I remember actors saying they never watched their work and i said like, god if i was an actor i'd love to sit and watch myself and like, but i really understand why they don't i mean it's it's a you know it's it's hard it's so weird as well because you put so much of your you know you bleed for these things you know every waking hour for for two plus years it is is of your life, of your family life, of your social life, not that you have much when you're working. And so everything pours out and then it's just like a half an inch spine on a, on a, on a shelf in, in Best Buy, <laughs> you know, and that's, and you kind of, you like, oh, is that really all, all, all this is? Um, so it's, um, you know, it's, it's, but you just, you know, you have to just, go along for the experience and and hope that audiences you know saw something in that theater that that stays with them um and you know hopefully enriches in some way or or that they come away you know having enjoyed that time then you know then it's worth it but ultimately then it's like all right i'm going to rest for a bit and 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 do other things and then when the right project comes along you know get get back and get back in the saddle yeah and d- does the two experiences now knowing the amount of work and the volume and the, the 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 commitment of time that it's going to take does that inform you now in your next selection of a project you know do you immediately get off of um ghost in the shell and think i, ne- I never want to do that particular genre again or i never want to do something that big again or is it uh, does it all come down to the to the story for you I think you never want to do anything again once you've come off a film like that. You're like, oh, I'm, I'm done with everything. Yeah. No, I think it takes a, it takes a while, and I, I don't, you know, I think Ghost was especially difficult because of the scale of it, and and I think I didn't realize how much um, needed to go into it, and how many, you know, man hours of design needed to go into it. Um, and I would love to just turn up on a location scout and go, all right, we'll shoot here. You know, instead of, all right, we'll shoot here and then we'll have to rebuild that bit and we'll do that bit in post and we'll have to put green screens there and we'll have to, like, we'll have to make a special door because they can't walk through a normal door. It's got to be a door that, you know, flyaway door. And now they can't wear that because it's not, you know, it's not sci fi or it's not medieval. So just be able to, like, you know, dress people from what you can get on the shelves and, and, and just walk around streets and go, that looks nice would be, a, would be very liberating. So, uh, we'll see but you know that's also the fun part of the process but it's um you know as as a you know someone who's who's in 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 inspired by design and architecture and and fine art then it's you know it is nice to build those worlds yeah 
And and normally when we, uh, in closing, as we wrap these things up, we always sort of ask for some sort of advice. And I think this is a unique opportunity because we have a lot of people listening to the show right now that are um, either in the commercial world as directors and doing big things and then trying to to make the pivot over uh, and be successful as you have. Uh, And I'd be interested to hear your take on, you know, advice that you give to people when in that in that move or what maybe they don't know about the feature world that you wish you'd known uh, when you started the huntsman or when you started ghost in the shell is there anything that you any uh, advice or or things that you could possibly save some heartache on i don't think there's any saving of heartache i think you've got to be prepared <laughs> for heartache i think you know it's it's about resolve really and i think it's about um wanting to do it you know i think i think that the commercials is a is a very you know or at least when I was doing it, it was a very kind of um, happy and, and quite luxurious lifestyle. I think it's changing quite a lot, and I think it's dramatically changing. Um, but, you know, you have to be prepared to, you know, drop everything or, you know, lose everything and go in as... It's a bit like going to school, I guess. You know, you come in, you do your, f- you know, your five years, you get to the top of that, the middle school or high school or whatever and then you have to drop everything and start as the kid again and and you know with all that comes from that and i think you've got to be prepared to like go and work for nothing you've got to be prepared to um to lose those things that you that you were comfortable with and 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 you've got to be prepared to roll your sleeves up and and get stuck in and and be prepared to fight and i think you've got to really focus on on taking the project that that really inspires you that you want to make those sacrifices for um because it's certainly not easier you know there's it's 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 funny when i was working a lot in commercials you know you come home exhausted after a three-day shoot and i remember i i I said to someone i was working with who'd done a lot of films i was like god but it can't be like this on a film every day can it and he's like Mm, yes i was like what <laughs> 90 days like this i'm gonna die he's like you know it's a marathon you just gotta run slowly yeah I was like, I, I, but it was i was quite shocked going into huntsman that i that i wouldn't have uh you know some time down or like you know it's, i i guess i was just being a bit spoiled but i thought you know that prep would end and we'd have a couple of weeks to kind of gather ourselves and then we'd start shooting it was all be quite luxurious but literally you end kind of nine months of prep on a friday and you start shooting on the on the monday morning at Jesus. 5 a.m and you're like oh god yeah and then you cut the and then you cut the film you know straight after so it's it's um yeah, I think you've got to really want to do it. And if you really want to do it, you'll be prepared to, you know, to, to do what it takes to do it. But it's, look, I've had a, I've, I've had a wonderful ride in, in commercials. I've had a wonderful ride in feature films. And I, you know, I hope both continue. I, I, I love each as, uh, as much. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's the, the bright side is there's, there's no better job. So if you've even got an opportunity to do it, stick with it. Beautiful. I, I, I like it. I like the dose of reality too, right at the end of just saying uh, how, how hard it is. I'm sure uh, I'm sure people appreciate it. And I'm a big fan of the work and uh, I look forward to the next projects. Thanks for coming on and, and taking time out to, to share. No problem. Thanks so much, Patrick. Oh man. All right, everybody. A big thank you to Rupert once again for taking time to come on the show and talk about feature films and its transition and the move from uh, commercials to features and that whole world. Hopefully you got a lot out of it. I know that I did. Now, uh, coming up next week, I mentioned it before the interview. We've got Colin Watkinson, cinematographer behind Handmaid's Tale. He is going to be on the show next week. Looking forward to that. If you're a Patreon supporter, make sure you check out the live stream this Thursday at 7 p.m. Pacific time. It's going to be a lot of fun. Get your projects in if you want to get those featured. Hit the hotline if you've got questions. Uh, Try and keep it focused on cinematography uh, rather than what you had for breakfast. And that is, I think that is all the information that we have to share today. Now, uh, you heard the whole podcast, right? And that whole podcast brought to you by uh, the Music Bed. When they said they're making better music accessible to everyone, they were not kidding. They don't kid. There's no humor there. Uh, They just announced their all-new membership program, the first music licensing subscription of its kind releasing this summer. Musicbed believes everyone should have access to great music in their projects. 
regardless of their budget or workflow, Membership is here to make their world-class roster of artists and composers available for all of your projects. Now, Membership will give you unlimited access to a majority of Musicbed artists, uh, all at a flat monthly or yearly rate based on the types of films that you make. And if you still want single-use licenses, never fear, they're not going anywhere. Membership is just a brand new option to make music licensing work better for you and your workflow. They listen to people, right? They listen to the customers. The customers send in, hey, this would probably be better if we tried this. Music bed smart enough and nice enough to go in. You know what? Maybe you're onto something here. Maybe this whole membership thing might just work. We're going to be the crazy ones. Let's try. So be one of the first to learn more at musicbed.com slash membership. And of course, don't forget, you get 20% off your next on-site license with the coupon code WANDERING20. And that's a W capitalized. I'm not sure if that makes a difference, uh, but someone out there will let us know, right? If you've used that, that code uh, and it doesn't work, try capital. Maybe it will. Okay, that is going to do it for this episode of the podcast. Once again, uh, many thanks for checking it out and uh, we will see you in the next episode. Actually, I'm probably going to put this on Instagram TV as well. If you are watching this, if you made it through 50, how, how, how long is this thing now? Hour and a bit? If you made it through that much on Instagram TV, you have done well for yourself. Uh, okay, check it out on YouTube as well. And leave a comment, subscribe to the channel, or don't. Uh, tell the channel to go fuck itself. Okay, that's going to do it for this week. We will see you in the next one. Thanks. You've been listening to the Wandering DP Podcast. For more information on the topics discussed in this episode and for show notes, visit www.wanderingdp.com. Thanks for joining us and be sure to rate, like, and subscribe on iTunes.